Oh, and you're very welcome to the show. I know you, you sometimes listen to us when you're commuting, driving to Swindon, you know, three hours either way, a couple of times a week, and you're normally very busy playing games two, three times a week. So how are you finding this this change? Yeah, obviously, uh, anxious to get back, getting antsy in the house here. So it's, um, yeah, it's difficult times for everyone, really. I think the plan at the minute, we've been told a uh, bit of a loose plan, but it's a plan nonetheless that we'll be back training around the 15th, 16th of May. With the with the, I think a two or three week program to go into the season start and behind closed doors on the fifth or sixth of June, so um, yeah, no, it's it's obviously difficult being stuck in the house and you now from talking to lads, they're up in the air whether they should be taking this time to rest the bodies or just keep taking over because the season hasn't actually finished yet or, or which way to to treat it. So it's a it's up in the air as I said, but now we're just all anxious to get back. Yeah, I mean I know it's a, it's obviously a very everyone's aware that this is a very serious sort of health crisis and I know your wife Kira worked as a nurse so we'll be very much aware of what's going on but so we're, we're putting all that in context and we know where football stands but I mean, from your own perspective I mean you want this season to 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 survive this is a, a goal scoring record um you know which is sort of top drawer like you don't want this to be erased from the record books here I mean you, you need this season to come back Oh, definitely. Yeah, from a selfish <laughs> point of view, definitely. I mean, that's um, reason the club... enough for the whole thing to be brought back. I think. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're aware. Then, we're only, you know, yeah. We, we... <laughs> no, but from the club's point of view as well, obviously we're doing very well, and I think we're a point off top of the game in hand, and um, obviously want to get promoted. But uh, I think the fair trying to take off the selfish shot. The fair thing to do is to get the league finished, and then because then it's fair for everyone starting next year. Mm -hmm. So whatever like compensations have to be made next year, everyone has to make them together on a level playing field. And then you can go forward from there, whether that be a competition, a cup competition now with the, the, um, the fixture list or whatever, and a few, a few more Saturday Tuesdays in there. But I think that is the best option, yeah. It, it is a strange one. I mean, it's the same for the players in our, in our league here that, okay, they're only five games into the season. So it's a bit strange because some of them might be warming up. But... Now that you haven't played for whatever it is, you know, I don't know, five, six weeks or whatever the actual figure, I mean, can you tell in your body you haven't played as such? I mean, do you feel like you're naturally, as much as you're doing your whatever fitness work you're meant to do, I mean, can you tell you're going to need time to get back into it, to get sharp again when it, when it comes around? Whenever it comes yeah. around, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. I think the sharpness would be the big thing. The, uh, I, could, I could imagine that it'll be in that three week program. I reckon there'll be a lot of games like Friendly's been put in there just the fact to get the match fitness back. Because mm. we've obviously we've got a game in hand with just 10 games and they're going to try cram them 10 games into a short period of time. So it, it, it'll be a matter of getting the match fitness in as quick as possible so lads don't get injured really in that, in that cramped fixture list. So it's going, to be, it's going to be very interesting how it is. But I'd imagine the, the training program will be crammed with a lot of Friendly's and stuff. And, um, yeah, I don't, I'd imagine that's the that's the way to do it. And I think from if if people are smart about it, if you if you go for like everyone's gonna be in lockdown together and if or behind closed doors together, if they could get maybe some friendlies with like Premier League teams coming down to the lower leagues so people can maybe pay online to watch these games to kind of create a bit of revenue for the lower league clubs, that might be something that um I'd imagine they're thinking of. And um, there'd be a good way maybe to kind of get a get a bit of cash boost into the lower league clubs as well. It must be very difficult for the players and like League of Ireland players as well in that if you'd known all this in advance, you could nearly take this as your holidays like of sorts or you just stop training. But you must, you must be nearly 50 between a rock and a hard place in terms of do I train, do I stop, do I do full train, do I do something in between or whatever? No, definitely. Another, if I think about it now, like it's probably worse than the League of Ireland last because they're just off the back of the pre-season and nobody enjoys them. And mm. like realistically, they're going to have to go back into them when it, when it all starts back up again. And, I know lads are afraid to stop, you know, and you've got your fitness, you don't want to lose it. So so lads will be out doing their running when they can and, and, and trying to keep their bodies in good shape and then obviously they'll have to go back in and, and get a bit blasted again. So it's um no, it's difficult. Like it's it's something unheard of. None of us know what to do because well, no one's ever experienced this before. So it's just a matter of kind of taking it as it comes and I'm sure the the sports scientists will be getting their uh, their money's worth to be they'll be valuable, I'd imagine, coming into the next few weeks now when it all kind of starts coming back around again. So, so we're obviously looking almost to get some light relief from the news of what's going on at the moment. So, like, I guess, you know, we're happy to get you on as sort of an ex-League of Ireland player who's gone on to have a very good career. But if I say to you now, you know, what do you think about, like, how do you reflect on your time in the League of Ireland? What springs to mind? 
is there a picture is there a moment is there a, a goal like what when you think of your time in the league what do you think of um well it obviously made me like it did it was incredible for me like i wouldn't uh, when i would have been what coming through at 18 like there's no way i would have been able to do that in england so i just would have if i was english for example i wouldn't have been able to, i wouldn't be a footballer now i wouldn't imagine um, I think the fact that I was able to get games in Ireland and at a good competitive level helped me massively. Um, I would have been a bit of a late developer in my body as well as such, where at 18, I probably looked about 15, 16, you know that way. So coming into myself in my early 20s or whatever, rather than you know, a lot of young lads coming through now and you see that they're men before they're men. Um, so for me, like, in value, and there were so many big games. Like, I was so fortunate, obviously, Coming through our overs, the madness of um, playing under Scully, then Jim Crawford came in and Michael, Michael O'Neill down for a short period before I went to Sligo. Then obviously the madness of that place as well under Cookie and, and some great times and some unbelievable games. And a lot you know what of a mad batch of managers there. When yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like we should break yeah. these down by phases. I mean, <laughs> yeah. let, let's just, let's just go the back first to the hour, start let's there. do Pat Scully. <laughs> yeah, tell us about a dressing room with Pat Scully because there's... There's a lot of stories out there. So we want to compare, you know, hype versus reality. I mean, what was the Pat Scully dress room like? Yeah, it's you now a couple of years ago, I bumped into him in the City West Shopping Centre during the <laughs> summer. And, uh, I hope you're wearing your club the... blazer. Yeah, no, yeah, no, he was, he came over to me and told me he made me the player I was and all that, the usual stuff. <laughs> he was, uh, no, he was, he was good for me. He obviously gave me the, the break at the time. Um, I was playing for over 21s under Dave Campbell and, I think I only played a game or two before Pat pulled me up into the into the first team, and um, myself and Podge. So it was, um, you know, it was like I owned quite a lot in that sense. He mad like you know he come in at half time, you could hit one all, and the, the physio table would be getting turned upside down. There'd be bottles getting kicked left, right, and centre, tiles falling out of the ceiling, all that type of stuff. And he, you'd never, you could never read him. You you think you've done well, and you come off after the game, and he'd hammer you, and you wouldn't even know why. And it was just, it was just a madman, like, and but some of the stuff worked, and like he obviously got the club back from the first division up to the the premier premier division at the time. And that was the and, mad thing. Uh, his record for wherever he was in the League of Ireland was actually very good. Yeah, no, look, he was, look, he did, he he had success at Rovers in that sense, and obviously kept him in the league then. And I think the first season we done reasonably okay, mid table maybe for first time coming back, and then, and then. Um, yeah, whatever happened. Look, he's mad. Look, I know my, my, my debut was made off. Me and Podge, I think, made a debut together at Ward for the way. And, like, we only made Organic, it because he fell, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he fell out with about five players on the, <laughs> on the team bus before. And that's how we, we got to play. The guy was actually out having a few points with me mates on a Thursday night. Now we're near the first team at the stage. Dave Campbell rings me and goes, you're playing tomorrow against Wardford. I had to put the point down. I was like, oh. Did you finish yeah. the point? No, no. It was, only, it was only on my second one. I, got. I, took the, I took the football serious. So I must have had a weekend. <laughs> but it, so I put the, put, the, put the point down. I was like, you're serious? And he was like, yeah, listen, like, this is not going down to sit in the bench or anything like that. You don't have to play. Like, and I was like, oh, yeah, happy days. So I um, arrived for the bus the next day. So I got onto the bus and I'm sitting maybe maybe three or four seats in the back, and I just hear roaring down the front of the bus. What's going on here? So Scully's gone through a couple of lads and buzzers behind me at the back of the bus. <laughs> Next team buzzers, him and a show now each other, and Scully's like, yeah, that's you. Oh, never want to see you play for me again. And uh, all this carry on. So that's me and Podge kind of, I don't know, Podge might have made his debut before me, but I, I made my debut that night the way to Wartford. So it was, uh, yeah, mad, mad, brilliant though. Yeah, and I see your your relationship with Rovers, of course, as well. I mean, was this around the time that you'd uh, you'd met Kira's family already? Your 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 you you were like you were the Shamrock Rovers team went beyond football with you as well too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Kira's family are all Rovers season tickets and holders and stuff. And the uh, first time I went into the house, the outfit was waving a flag with a scarf on. The, the brother had the jersey on the lot, trying to embarrass me or embarrass her rather. So it was. Uh, <laughs> No, they've been great, but they, they still go up to the games and stuff, and they're always trying to get me back. And it's uh, no, they're great, great, great uh, Rovers fans, yeah. You were there when the, the change, like when the club went to Tala, and that was obviously, I mean, as someone who was a local lad, like you, you, you've seen a couple of sides of Rovers, like the end of the, the homeless years, as they were called, but then the transition into start of something completely different, albeit, I guess, I think you were frustrated yourself that you probably weren't playing around that time. Yeah, and I was a, obviously 
driving past that stadium for years as even as a kid. I just remember being burning for years, this big hole and hole and tallow like you just going, Boy, what's going on with this place? And you always hear the Thomas Davis stories and all that carry on. But um no, obviously when I was coming through it would have been we would have been at Talca Park and then when Michael O'Neill was coming in it was coming to uh it was obviously coming up to to Talla and it, they they done it. The, the club at the time felt like it was shaped so much better. They were training in like kind of Sacred Hearts facility in Killing Arden, which is very good. And at the time was brand new, brand new like four G Astro ahead of its time. And did some nice pitches on the side. We were training there, and um, they had the gym across the road and the in the Margin Hotel, and everything was together like real real close to the stadium, which is unusual. Um, mm-hmm. even even over here in England, it's unusual. You could be driving mm-hmm. to a training ground and coming back in change a half an hour away, and all that carry on. It was. It felt really good, like, and everything was real. It got real professional all of a sudden. And um, I'm not saying that Scully wasn't professional. He was. Like, it was just the, the whole club itself felt like it was going that way. And, um, yeah, so I would have been there the night the first game. Tickets were, you just couldn't get them. Like, everyone knocking on the house and everything, looking for tickets, couldn't couldn't get them for anyone. Um, and it was a great occasion. So loud. Like, the uh, like just the police horses and all. It's obviously, walking up to, or going up to the stadium and, Mm. I just remember like the police horses and crowds everywhere. There was definitely more people outside that that couldn't get in. And, um, like I remember me, my dad being at the game and afterwards telling me there was grown men crying and stuff because they waited so long for this, and it was mm. uh, it was brilliant to be part of. I actually played against the game was against Sligo on the day I ended up being at Sligo then a few months later. So it was uh, no it was great times for the club and they've obviously kicked on since and they're they're doing very well now. What did you make of Mick O'Neill? Sorry, Dan. What did you make? Because he's, he's always a manager that's really intriguing me. Um, and in terms of just the unbelievable success he has, what, what was your understanding of him at the time or your reflections on him? Yeah, he was very good at breaking down um, individual parts of the game. So like, if I'm thinking back, he was one of the first managers I ever had where he'd work on the strikers for a session and he'd tell you, this is what you need to be when the ball's over here. You need to be here and doing this and, and, that, and that type of thing. Um, he was very good at breaking down and doing his homework and the opposition. And I remember, I, we, the, I think the second game of the season might have been against Bray away, and I can't remember the result. It might have been a draw, but the, I remember coming into training the couple of days later, and he, he like he was apologising to us, us the lads, because he says he, he, he obviously doesn't know the league enough yet, and he, he can't do enough homework on the opposition. And so I'd imagine going forward, I, I wasn't too long there after that, but he, he really got into like analysis of the opposition and this is how we're going to beat them and, and, and stuff like that. So he's um and like you, you look at his career like he's had nothing but success he's done unthinkable mm. things everywhere he's been, even before Rovers at, at Breek and he was doing very well over there and that's obviously how he he would have been how he got the job at Rovers at the time so like you can't you have to give him credit. It, it's interesting though that yourself and and Podge as you mentioned Parry Gammon that you both essentially had to to leave Rovers you know for for experience and and both ended up using Sligo to some degree to. Uh, to propel on yourself to the levels that you have now in terms of actually making a sort of sustained career across the water? Yeah, definitely. I think um, Rovers at the time would have been like squad very heavy. You know, like it would have been Gary, Gary Twig, I think Tyke Person would have been still there, Desi Baker, Podge, myself, all fighting for these these spots. Sometimes when you play one up front, you play two up front on his own. So it was, like, was going to be really hard to get in. Um, and Sligo, like, obviously amazing for me. Amazing for Podge as well. He he wasn't there very long before he got his move. So it's um now we owe that club a lot. Yeah, it's best time, best days of my life down there. I knew that the minute I left the place. So instead so of walking away from the best couple of years, I'll never get these couple of years again. It was just so much fun. Just yeah. all the lads, you just it's proper community feeling down there. It's like it's obviously a massive football in town as well. Um, such a small population. I think like ten percent of the population of Sligo go to the games. So like that's that is the mad thing about like Sligo and Dundalk, and maybe even Sligo more so than Dundalk. Once you're in that town, you know when you're walking down the street, people will talk to you, will recognise you. It's a proper football town. Oh, it's huge! Yeah, it's huge. Like if well, if you put it into context, it'd be like Rovers having ten thousand at every game because a hundred thousand people in Tallaght or so. So that that's what you're looking at down. Like it's just everyone loves it. It's proper the heartbeat of the town, and you you'd be walking you be getting half price on dinners and stuff and you're going out for, <laughs> for food. Happy and, days. Yeah, yeah. Every second point to be free. It'd be, it'd be that, that's with Cookie, I'd say, though, is it? <laughs> oh, Cookie, yeah. Some character him, yeah. But the, uh, no, it was brilliant. Half like, and ice place. <laughs> yeah. Coming across him as well, like, and you look at the success he's had in his career, he was massive for the likes of me and Pudge. 
But he obviously brought together that great atmosphere as well because, you know, as you were probably alluding to there, when you were playing under him, there was a special sort of team bond where you were all, it was proper crack, I'd say, like. Well, he was in the middle of it. Like, he was driving this. Like, <laughs> myself, myself, Matthew Blaine, Cornell and Kane got a, a house together. And two days later, Cookie moves in next door. <laughs> three, three days later, he's, in the, he's actually in the kitty for the food shop during the week. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> dictating, dictating what we have to cook him for dinner at the end of the night. And you'd sit down, you'd have your, you'd have your dinner at about five or six in the evening. And he'd say to choose, he'd be like, come on, we go up and have a couple of points, lads. <laughs> Welcome to Ron having a couple of points the four of us and that was just the, the way the place was and as you're walking up you might knock on Danny Danny Ventry's door on the way up and before you know it there'll be six, seven, eight, ten of us in the pub having a few points on a Tuesday and it was just that type of that type of camaraderie there like we all just lived out of each other's houses and like all the all our, our wives and girlfriends are all still very, very close now and best of mates and it's just um the way Matthew, he did it, like, the way, though, like, yeah. You, you mean you, that's probably the one thing a manager would be told: never, never, never get too friendly with the players. Yet he obviously was. Ah, oh, stop! Yeah, like he, like he sits on the back of the bus. So you're you're tra- you're traveling. Like, usually, you'd be on a, a team coach, the manager, and the star at the front. Now he's he's down the back playing the cards and um, getting everyone getting everyone involved and stuff. He's he's great. Like you, and he's that type of character where you, like you just want to you want to run through brick walls from. He's that um, he's that lovable and and. And he knows his football. You can't, you cannot have a conversation with him unless it's about football. You could try talk about something else, talk about a car. Two minutes later, he just switches that over to talking about football again. He's proper mm. in love with the game, and he's got some eye for it. Like he, he sees things that he'd be on the touch, like say you're on the bench, and he'd be on the obviously in the dugout or whatever, looking at the game, and he'd say, "Look, look what he's after doing over there." And I was, like, "What? What's he done?" And then two minutes later, bang, they have to go walk, going through and scoring against us. And he just has that eye where he sees the, the picture of the game he has. Mm. It's, it's phenomenal. I mean, I mean Owen, look, I, I went over and did a piece with you before Christmas and, and people may not realise that you actually are still, although you're playing uh, for Swindon, you're living in the Liverpool area, basically. And you're, two of your close friends there, closest friends there are Danny Ventry and John Dillon. So that, if people say you don't always make friends in football easily, but I mean, you have. And, and that's Ligo Rovers' time that legacy still lives on for you. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And like Matthew Blinkhorn's only up in um living up in Blackpool. You see him quite often as well. And um if got if if we were very close to if if Gavin Pierce to live if Gavin Pierce was living in Liverpool, we'd be living out of his house as well. That's how close we also are. But the uh the, honestly an incredible time, like proper like um just everyone loved each other and that was all down to the cookie really like he done his homework on, on um personalities as much as ability when he was getting players in the door and it was um and it worked like the first season I went down there we were scrapping for our, to stay up but as League of Ireland does I think with two or three games to go a couple of teams went bust so we kind of knew yeah. with two or three with two or three games to go we were safe I remember walking out of the showgrounds against Strata and I think Ian Ryan was playing centre back for Strata time and the two was we lived around the corner from each other growing up walking out and he was like did you hear about I think we might have been dirty maybe at the time did you hear about dirty dirty are gone I said, oh yeah, here, yeah, yeah. That's both of us are safe, we're safe, oh lovely. And the, the, that's the way <laughs> the game, yeah. that would have been a game, that should have been a game, two teams fighting, scrapping it out, ended up turning out to be a bit like a testimonial game in the end. But the um and then obviously the next season is when like we started that first season actually we got to the cup final as well. That would have been the Tala um mm. the Tala Cup final against Sport and Fingal. And then there was three loads of cup finals, like three cup finals and FU Cup finals in the bounce. I think it's a I think it's uh, a League Cup final as well that we played down in Sligo against Monaghan so a um, lot of success and then obviously the year I left they went on to win the league so a very successful period for the club Yeah, I mean I think you, you told me a story about a player who was teetotal before he moved down to Sligo and uh, I didn't name him until I spoke to Aaron Green around a month or so later yeah. and, he can, <laughs> and, and he confirmed that it was him so I mean it, it was a very as you know you mentioned it with, with Cookie before like it was a very social environment. Like it was actually, it was allowed. I guess you know that was part of the the the, the attraction of the place. If lads were all going to live away together, they probably had to to do a bit of that. Yeah, definitely. Like, and like I'm 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 saying it here as if we were, it was like Mike Bassett and it was uh, mm. lads out drinking all the time. At the start, it felt like that. When I first went down, I went from the professionalism of Michael O'Neill and and. Um, how like he was going about things and he'd come in like three months in, Michael O'Neill come in and go, he'd have a list. He would have been over to the gym in the Maldron 
would have asked for a list of all the players that have been through the doors on their own time. Now, fortunately, me, me and Simon Madden used to go up daily, but Podge yeah. didn't. Podge got an awful time off from over that. He was that professional about things. And um, obviously, gone down straight away to Saigon was a bit, little bit looser in that sense where lads were out having a bit of fun or whatever. And, but to, to be fair, the years that we started to get successful, that, that died down a lot. There was no, like, there'd be no midweek drinking, basically, put it that way. There was no like, sneaking out of flats at eight o'clock at night when you're getting itchy feet or whatever. It was, um, it was more just that lads were on it then. And then like, yeah. on, the week, on the weekend, we'd all get around each other and have a couple of <laughs> But you, you, you became obsessed with your diet. That's one of the things that, that was a turning point for you. Yeah, huge. Yeah, um, Jim Lachlan. He signed um, Jim Lachlan. I think he well, came from Dundee, one of, the, one of the Dundee clubs. Had a great career in Scotland. He came over to us at maybe 33. Yeah, 33. And this fellow walks into the dressing room and he's ripped. Ripped. And like, you, you get to talking to him and he's weighing his food. He's writing it all down in the diary. And I'd never really came across. And I never knew anything about diets. This is pre iPhones and, and all that stuff. And he was like... Um, he was like, yeah, no, you need to get on your diet. You need to get on your diet. And he kind of drilled that into me. And um, that would have been the, f- that would have been the, f- so that would have been the first year of the cup final that was in the Aviva. Um, he left then. And in that off season, I was like, no, I need to, this is it now. Like I'm 23, 22. And I was like, if I need to, if I'm going to have a good career at this, um, get a good wage out of this league. And I was thinking that Gavin Pearce at the time, because Pearce would have been a high earner in the league. I said, we need to get to them wages. Like, it's gonna, I'm going to end up having to go back in the tools if I don't get there. So I'll, um, I'll have a go. So I went down and bought a men's health magazine. And I literally, because uh, that's what Jim used to read. And um, I literally opened the page where a man had his diet in that had these rock hard abs and all that. Carry on. I just covered, I just did the exact diet he did for six weeks and trained twice a day and went back into the season flying. And then would have got, got, got a move at the end of the next season, yeah. That's, that's uh, so it's just, I mean, it's funny how things happen like that, that you... You have that season because it's it's a striking thing I think in recent years like Shawnee McGuire and and certain players that it just seems like it clicks and it's almost hard to explain how it happened but it just happens and like you're having one of those seasons at that at the moment but that season in Sligo before you left it just out of nowhere even the perception of you as a player within the league seemed to change almost overnight. Yeah, I think there was another factor as well is that we were going through, it was early in the season, we were going through a bit of a, so I would have been playing a lot on the wing um, and I would have got a few goals from the wing here and there. Look, as a winger, I would have been quite a good, uh, a very good goal scoring record as a winger. Um, but he, our, our strikers at the time, Blinks and I don't know who else was playing up front, we, they had went through a bit of a, a dry patch. And Cookie used to always say to him, where's your favourite position? I'd say, I'm a striker and he'd laugh at me. And he says, now you can go out there and, and do the running on the wing for me. And then, um, but then like, they were going through the dry patch, so we just mixed it up one day. I think we played Bray at home, and I scored a hat-trick, played up front, scored a hat-trick, and that was it then. I just, he played me up front for the, for the rest of the season. I went on to score, a, I think I got 25 that season, and then obviously um, kicked on from there. But yeah, just little, he was able to, obviously, I go back to the personnel he brought in. He was able to bring in the likes of Jim, something totally different that hadn't been there. and Maybe like, he would have looked at him from the outside in, going, right, he's had success in Scotland. I've looked at him, I know what the type of character he is. He might be able to do good for the young lads here. So they start going on the right road. And obviously it did, like it worked. And, and then obviously to be able to switch my position in that way. And um, I was talking to him, I was talking to Alan Carley there recently about him. And he, he, he was saying, like, what's the best piece of advice you ever got? And Cookie was one of them where he's like, double down on what you're good at rather than trying to fix what you're bad at. And he'd look mm-hmm. at me up front and he's like, don't be trying to hold up the ball or anything. You just run away. And the, the lads will find you. Just keep running into the box, be on the shoulder all the time, all the time. And um, and that that's that's stood to me like I was able to score a lot of goals off the back of that. Yeah. So like you've you've now gained a, a real experience of the football industry now. About you know you've moved from club to club. You've had good spells. You've had bad spells at various places. Um, and this year has been a, a, a particularly good spell. I mean, is there a part of you though that still thinks you'd like to come home at one stage? Is, does that linger? within you or are you sort of on the fence a bit about that? No, definitely like um long term we'll definitely be moving home, the family. Um I think before the season started there would have been something I might have been looking at now coming into this summer I would have probably wanted to move home uh, move home like but obviously mm-hmm. with the way the season's gone I think it'd be, be silly of me really to, to move home now considering what my options will be this summer or next season or whatever it's gonna be. So yeah. um no, I'll definitely, I'll, we'll, we'll put them in a couple of years over here, but I'd definitely like to, 
I'd like to win the league at home. That's what I'd like to do. Um, I'm mindful that I don't want to be too old. I don't want to be going over and it'll be a team that won't, that won't be challenging that'll want me at the time. So I'll, um, I'll take all them things into consideration. But no, I'll definitely, I'll definitely be moving home. I definitely want to, want to grace the league again. But um, it'll probably be another couple of years, yeah. I know mm. people kind of um, compare, you know, the League of Ireland to the lower league clubs in England and to an extent in Scotland as well. But like when I was going to Cheltenham there uh, in in March, I passed the county ground actually on the train. And um, for some reason, when I was a kid, I had a fascination that year that Swindon were in the in the Premier Division, and the ground probably hasn't changed much. But you're playing at a, you know, you're playing a really good stadium, um, good wages, you know, proper proper football industry and. I guess people maybe sometimes need to be reminded of that when you're playing at the level you're playing at. No, definitely. I've obviously played in a lot of the, the divisions now over the years, going from obviously Scotland to, to League 2, League 1 and the Championship and there's differences in all of them. Even from when I moved from the League of Ireland to Scotland straight away, it was just like, oh, this is, this is much different. Um, much more intense and f- physical and even going from League two to, to League one is different in style of play, not maybe as much physical, but from League one to the championship then you're looking at just absolute athletes like you, it's hard to keep up with them um, and then so there, there is there is differences like but you, you look at I, I think I know people in the at home want to think that the League of Ireland is better than the lower divisions in England, but it's it's I can't say it's I don't want to be rude and say it's not, but it, there's no comparisons really like the for example like I've we played Plymouth away, eighteen thousand at the game this year. Unbelievable. And um, we've had yeah, we've had about four or five home fixtures this year, especially in the last previous ones where it was fourteen thousand at the games. Um it's it's a, like imagine that in the League of Ireland. You just it's um that hasn't been seen since what decades and decades ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's, in, in some senses as well, is it the consistency of the opposition, like you know, like you're never going to play a part-time team in League Two, you know. Like you have Rovers and Dundalk recently, a really good standard of game and good level, and two really fit professional teams. But like that's every week in the lower leagues in England. Whereas at home here, it's obviously, and that's what I always say to people when they talk about comparisons that the the leagues in England are proper leagues, whereas here it's way more. The the, the level between the top and bottom can be huge. Yeah, there's there's probably leagues within the leagues at home. Do you know, like yeah. the, the yeah, obviously the difference. The lads that are the ones that are challenging for Europe are so far ahead of the ones that are in the bottom half of the table as such. Um, over here, it's like yeah, it's it's. I think the conference is even all full time now. That just shows you the the, the strength. So you're looking at over a hundred clubs all full time, and it's religion over here. It really is like this is the football, is everything like. And um, I think at home is also. It, oh, I know people don't really want to hear it, but the fact that the Gaelic is is there as well is gonna gonna hamper that for, for League of Ireland clubs trying to compete and such but it's um no it's very competitive over here and the fact that there's so many teams as well in the leagues like there's we forty six league games like that's in League One, League Two in the championship, loads of teams, like ninety two clubs stretch across the four divisions. It's um and all all with good good fan bases as well. So it's it's a bit of a different animal really. Just like before, we did a special sorry Dan, we did a special on Stephen Kenny last week. How do you expect him to get on? Yeah, well, he's another another manager that's only ever had success, really. Like, I know he's a bit of a blip at Rovers, but he, he's gone on and done so so well in, in the league, definitely. And, and obviously done very well for the 21s as well. Um, Yeah, no, listen, good stuff. He plays the style of football people have been craving for forever, really, for Irish teams. So, and when you when you listen to him speak, his, his confidence and how he wants his teams to play, you know he's going to go and try to adapt that style into, into his team. So, it's going to be... um. No, oh, it's going to be interesting. It's one I'm looking forward to. Just, just finally, Owen, before we let you go, I mean, I know you're also, you know, you're into your sort of business interests as well. You've had various projects. You've had a childcare company at home. I mean, during this stoppage now, I know you've got kids running around you in the house, but are you still reading up, learning, looking at other things or trying to use that time productively? I've never had less time in my life, if I'm being honest. These kids. Really? Yeah. Ah, oh, stop. It's uh, up, up from six o'clock and then it's carrying still about eight o'clock at night. So by the time that comes around, I get me running then and then it's just to bed. So now it, it's worse now. Usually I'd be in mm-hmm. a hotel maybe twice a week. I get a few hours to myself to kind of read up and things, listen to a few bits. and um, But now it's, uh, I feel like I've no time at all at the minute. It's different than what most people are experiencing. I imagine that. I don't have kids or maybe their kids are a bit older mine are so young it's just hectic yeah, I feel sorry for Kira. I can't believe I ever doubted her 
before this. <laughs> <laughs> what with the Rovers connection? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, to be fair, she graphs, she graphs hard. She used to always complain about Saturdays because obviously not today, no school, no crash. I can't be that hard. Oh my God, I can't, I can't believe she does it. Listen, yeah, it's, um, it's, like Paul, it's like Paul Cook trying to look after the Sligo dressing room on a night out, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, exactly, yeah. Al- although actually that would suggest that Kira was more of a problem than the kids, if you get you know what I mean. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if that's a good comparison. But listen, Owen, it's been actually great. I mean, it's great to have you on. Um, hopefully, we'll have you on again. You never know. At some stage in the future, we might have you back on as a as a, as a current League of Ireland player. But I know you've got a bit of work to do in England still. So um, excellent, it's great to have you. Thanks, for having thanks me, a million, Owen. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Owen.